All righty. Welcome to another edition of Vegas Bad Boys of Podcasting. I'm your host, DJ Impact. I got the Vegas Bad Boys here with me. It's good to see you, gentlemen. And um, three count. That's where we're at right now. We got three good topics for tonight. And we're going to get right to it. Our first one is, uh, is titled, Where Does the Fiend Goes From Here? And that comes from the last word on sports.com. So I'm just going to set up uh, some of the things that he bring up and then we'll discuss it. Uh, he mentions that, you know, the fiend has been unstoppable uh, since the day Bray Wyatt unveiled his new persona. His whole aesthetic is nightmare fuel for kids and adults alike. Um, you know, these terrifying, but at the same uh, time, cool reminiscence of how Kane was back in the day. But he says, unlike the big red monster, his transformation and goals were never explained. His evolution from the original Bray Wyatt to the fiend just happened suddenly and no one knows why. Why it went away for an extended period of time and returned as the fiend, giving barely any details on his newfound evil. The character was much stronger now and could not feel pain. Fans were left wondering if this is still the work of Sister Abigail or did Bray Wyatt find someone or, or something more sinister and now serves a new master in the process. Then he goes around talking about how the about the, about the Wyatt family, how it started in 2012 in the in the main roster. It was known for uh, looking for misguided souls. Again, it talked about Sister Abigail. He used the term like "follow the buzzards." Of course, he had the lost sheep, which was uh, Luke Harper and Eric Rowan. Uh, it talks about how uh, he even made Daniel Bryan and Randy Orton question their own sanity and almost had them believing him at at one point. Um, it also talks about that uh, the fiend, uh, it, it says the fiend, on the other hand, uh, had this another mysteri mysterious story throughout his character run. He would rarely mention Sister Abigail. He would uh, spew out lines such as let me in, and he was put on earth to protect us, and with little to no context, this is where the questions would start to arise. Who's, who, uh, you know, who we're letting in? Is it still Bray Wyatt and Sister Abigail, or is it the unnamed demon who gave the Fiend power he harnessed, and who exactly uh, is the Fiend protecting us from exactly? And then he talks a little bit about what happened on Sm uh, SmackDown and Raw, uh, the Fiend's motivation. He says it got a little bit uh, murkier. Uh, there was a feud with Braun Strowman uh, that happened. Of course, his rivalry with Kevin Owens and Randy Orton says he uh, he had pushed another narrative that the Fiend quote, changes people, end quote. The question fans are asking is what is the real effect of the thing and why should the wrestlers be afraid of it? And to this day, this question remains unanswered. We'll talk about that in just a second. It also talked about, well, maybe a statistic return uh, to form would be something good. It, it mentions that the first and necessary step into the next phase of the characters is making it scarce, but keeping Bray Wyatt active he think he, he mentions like maybe finn balor's how he does the demon persona he doesn't come out all the time so maybe that would be uh kind of a good look or maybe how the undertaker how he how he served as the judge jury executioner cleansing the wwe would be a good storyline to go with uh, or giving the thing a clear purpose would add more depth to him and maybe freshen up his gimmick tremendously according to this writer uh, he also kind of mentioned that uh you know bringing back bray Wyatt as his as his old self would be reminiscent of the Jushin Thunder Liger and the Fiend could be much like Kishin Liger, which was rarely seeing alter ego of Jushin. So he mentions all of these things as well. More importantly now, just to kind of sum up what he also said, was that WWE is missing out on a potential successor to The Undertaker. And Bray Wyatt is an extremely talented mind and is unlike any other sport has ever seen. His constant evolution proves the genius of the Wyatt. The company's lack of direction for him endangers the character's lusters. Most fans are still into the gimmick, but for how long? Loving or hating someone and not knowing why will fans why why will fans leave questioning the reason they even supported this being in the first place? So, guys, let me just throw it out there. Do you think that? The fiend, and in some way, is just maybe slowly losing his 
uh, luster? Is there something, where can the fiend go from here? Um, you know, what's the real effect of the fiend and why should wrestlers be afraid of it? If, apparently, according to him, this has never been answered. There's a lot of questions he said that's never been answered. There's been things thrown out there and we've kind of accepted it and we, we kind of like it, but it just never explains certain things. So with that, why don't I start with you, Simon Street? Normally that's, I, I wait to see someone just to uh, see who want to start. But where would you say where the fiend is at right now? Of course, we haven't seen him for a while, but you know, when he does come back, should he have more of the demon effect where, you know, maybe he's just Bray Wyatt and every blue moon we see the fiend, or should we constantly see the fiend? Or where does the fiend go from here? Um, I think first of all, uh wanna point out that there's a lot of emotion that was in that uh that article. Apparently the mm -hmm. the, the writer is just not happy with the direction that WWE has uh, allowed, might I add, Bray Wyatt to kind of run with The Fiend and his alter personalities. Mm -hmm. But outside that, uh, I don't really honestly see a problem. I think that kind of what he's doing right now is uh, you never know what you're gonna get whenever Bray Wyatt comes back. We don't know if we're gonna get The Fiend. We don't know if we're gonna get, you know, Firehouse, uh, uh, Firehouse Clubhouse, you know, Bray Wyatt, or if we're gonna get, you know, Bray Wyatt from the Bayou in the Wyatt family. And that's the fun part about it. And it reminds me a lot of uh, Mick Foley. You know, sometimes you didn't know if you're going to get Cactus Jack. You didn't know if you're going to get Dude Love. You didn't know if you're going to get Mankind. And, 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 and it is fun. And again, it could be just me and maybe a small amount of people that feel the same way. But I, I feel that's a good way. And I think that the fiend right now, the fact that he doesn't have to be on TV and somebody is carrying... I would say the gimmick per se in Alexa Bliss to kind of run with it a little bit is pretty ingenious. And uh, so there's something that even as a young kid marking out, I was like, man, wouldn't it be cool? And I thought about it and it sounds stupid, but I'll say it. Uh, wouldn't it be cool if the Undertaker could transfer his powers into somebody else and somebody else was the Undertaker version of it? And even as a kid, it sounded stupid, but never thought in wildest dreams of course, Michaels would say that. I never thought in the wildest dreams with this this fiend that every person he's faced, which they talked about in the article, they've changed them. And I personally like that part about it. I like that when you face the fiend, if you don't let him in, because the only person that's let him in is Alexa Bliss. Everybody that does not let him in, per se, or fights it, has a negative effect. And at least that's where I thought this was going. So let, let me ask you, uh, Sin City, he says, look, giving the thing a clear purpose will add more depth to him and it'll freshen up the gimmick tremendously. Uh, do you think there, um, do, does the fiend not have a clear purpose? Is, is that lost somewhere in his, uh, in his character? And is that something that you think needs to be really freshened up? Yeah. I mean, I think that there toward the end, I mean, they kind of booked themselves into a bit of a corner. Um, you know, they knew what kind of a route that they wanted to go. Uh, they knew that they wanted to tell the story of Randy Orton and Edge. Mm -hmm. And so you have Randy Orton relapse his feud with Bray Wyatt. Um, so it, it, it was obvious uh, in hindsight that Randy Orton was the one that was being elevated from that you know, that exchange. Um, at this point, there has to be uh, some change to the gimmick in some way, shape or form. Um, I think that there at the very end, mm -hmm. um, people got kind of complacent with it. Um, I thought that it was awesome. And I still think that The Fiend is, a, is an amazing character. I think that mm -hmm. they did some amazing storytelling with it. Um, but, you know, you can't burn a guy to a fucking crisp um and then all of a sudden just have him go on like as if nothing happened obviously some things need you know there needs to be some form of a change with the gimmick um i'm really interested to see what's going to happen um now maybe wwe will just you know give us a big f you and well, you know yeah, they'll just treat it like as if that you know him being burned alive never happened and see that um, goes back to what i think maybe what the author is saying and, and i know it looked like matt is inching to get in but it goes to it goes to the point of maybe what he's saying people don't get an explanation all you know is you see a man get burned and then he come back should nothing not be safe should we just 
go suspend the, the what we saw and go, oh, okay, great, he's back. Should I mean everything? Every share of the storyline usually there's some sort of context to that, but for him there isn't. Let me go over to you, Matt Michaels. It says the the fans are asking what is the real effect of the thing and what why should wrestlers be afraid of this? It? What fans are asking this? Listen, he doesn't say that. He no shit, he doesn't question. say that. That's the problem. The fans are asking this. What WWE fan is going? God, I wonder what his motivation is for being a pro wrestler and doing what he's doing. Fuck this author, man. It's fucking horrendous. First off, he likes to compare Kane. Oh, maybe because it's you know a darker character. The Undertaker and Kane is all this guy could go to. All right, the Undertaker, for fuck's sake is a totally different person who uh you know if you look there wasn't much evolution except the 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 elevation of the character was just in layers and then all of a sudden he became an american badass who rode (laughs) motorcycles and shit like that so where did the fucking powers go fuck this guy number two um he didn't write he didn't mention firefly funhouse once bullshit fuck this guy fuck him hard because he's an idiot the the fact that he didn't even mention that character which is an actual different character than the fiend means he could go suck his own boo boo whatever you want to call his dick um because he can suck it the fact of the matter is removed yeah exactly no rib here if it's safe to say you're giving author a no vaseline fuck you hard reward yes absolutely absolutely um so he liked to point to kane here and say first of all kane's clear motivation was one thing all right beat up and take over and get revenge on my brother the undertaker Mm -hmm. right so when Kane loses at WrestleMania 20 or uh, WrestleMania um, 14 and then goes on to wrestle the uh, fire match and do a couple other things with Undertaker. And then uh, he starts going around with X-Pac and eventually, oh, that's right. He was a mute who had a horribly burned face, but thank God X-Pac gave him a little talking device that he could put towards his throat to talk. Oh, and then eventually he got good enough to get rid of that and actually have a voice. And then eventually we take off his mask and the hideous burns that we've been promised is nothing more than smeared black makeup from something they couldn't get together and a bad fucking shaven head um with hair still on it was awful so but even if all those things were bad and don't make sense at least they are answers to why king was in that transition no 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 no. one fair thing and that is this he came in with a clear-cut thing to defeat my brother to go against the undertaker that was that that story ended okay right what was his motivation from that point on? There's never a clear cut motivation. It happens through one story to the next. That's the point. The point is, is that one character cannot come in and have the same motivation for 10 fucking years. It's ridiculous. This guy basically put his own head up his ass to find this story because the idea here that First of all, Bray Wyatt, when he came in, <laughs> let's go back. He was Husky Harris. Yeah. All no, right. Way back. He was in, he was Nexus. Husky Harris. Yeah, when he was Hex, Husky Harris. Well, but <laughs> um, but the, the idea here is that when the Bray Wyatt character came in, he had a motivation of making the WWE his own, right? And his own image. Because we saw that with guys like Harper, Harper and Rowan. Then we saw it with Braun Strowman, who he didn't mention as part of the family at all. Who just mentioned he had a feud with. So then, as you know, as it comes to you have to evolve that character, right? You have him go away. He comes back, not as the Fiend first, but as the Firefly Funhouse character. 
and warning people about the fiend and that this thing is about to come. And because essentially the WWE did not let him in when he was Bray, then you got the two sides. You got this happy-go-lucky, oh boy, this is going to be fun, but you ain't going to like this, Bray Wyatt, and then you had The Fiend. The Fiend has just been burned to death. There has been no indication how he's coming back, when he's coming back, or why he's coming back. So fuck this article. And then the author. He's pissed off and the thing hasn't even happened yet. <laughs> no Vaseline. No Vaseline. No. No. In fact, if I had a, like two raw dogs, double raw dog. It, oh, my God. Oh, my. Oh, okay. Hold on, man. Hold, hold on. You went too far, man. <laughs> In a row, yeah, one for Kane and one for Bray. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, with that, let's jump over into our second count. (laughs) Matt Michaels is uh catching his breath, drinking some water. He's he's lit right now, man. He's he's this author. Hey, author, stop pissing off Matt Michaels. Yeah, okay, damn, might as well just ask him to stop breathing. Everybody pisses Matt Michaels off. Right. Not that he pisses me off. The fact that he gets paid for this pisses me off. Well, let's go over to our second account. WrestlingInc.com had a had an article titled Edge Responds to Criticism of Winning the Royal Rumble match at the age of 47. Um, I'm just gonna really concentrate just on the uh the uh how it starts off and then a couple of edge quotes. And it just talks about how, of course, Edge is the winner of the 2021 Royal Rumble. And he was a guest on WWE after the bell with Corey Graves, where he talked about his goals in WWE after returning again. And Edge said that the criticism he received from some about the fact that he won the Royal Rumble at the age of 47 isn't something he's worried about. He said his main goal in coming back to WWE is just to tell great stories and mix it up with talent he's never faced before. And these are the couple of quotes. First one, all I can control is trying to be the best shape I can possibly be in. But my ass is in the gym so that at least I can look the part, move the part, feel the part, and that's all I can control. The last quote he said in this one that we'll concentrate on is, I can't control people's opinion. I can't control if people have ageism issues. What I want to do is come back and tell how the story is told and tell it with multiple dance partners. If those dance partners can take something from it, then that's my goal. All right, Sin City Steve. Is ageism the issue that fans really have with Edge? Or maybe is this the fact that people are going, well, what about all of the talent that just you know, are, are, are new in the biz or moving up in the biz that should maybe have that part versus someone who's been in there now for two, three decades. Is it ageism? So I think that, I think that with edge, you have a little bit of an out with that. Um, as he mentioned, uh, he never lost the world heavyweight championship. It was stripped from him. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's one of those things where that is a compelling storyline vehicle that you can use um, to put him back into the title hunt um, at mm-hmm. the age of 47. Realistically, I think that I can I can speak for a lot of people when I sit when I can outright say that I was I was extremely surprised that Edge won the Royal Rumble. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were a lot of people online that were upset about it. Um, Mm -hmm. I wasn't upset as much as I was unsure of how they were going to pull this off Um, because I didn't want it to be something that, um, you know, sacrificed um, putting over your younger talent um, just to make room for somebody that uh, stepped away or was forced away, I should say, for a while. Um, the, The thing is, they've already been very smart with how they're using edge. Mm -hmm. Um, They have put him into a role where um, 
They've had him in scenes in vignettes with people backstage. Um, I know that he just did, you know, something on SmackDown with Shinsuke Nakamura, where they were sitting in the back, they were standing in the back, they were talking to each other, Mm -hmm. but they still made a point of saying, Hey, this is Shinsuke Nakamura talking with edge, blah, blah, blah. So that right there got Shinsuke a little bit more of a rub as a result. Mm -hmm. Um, and he's done that across the, the board. Took guy backstage and talked to him. That gave him a rub. Well, dude, because you didn't even hear the conversation. It was just they were backstage talking. So he, here's the thing: is ultimately, would Shinsuke have been on the show otherwise? Not Seriously, probably, think probably like not. Not, and, okay. And, well, then but, there but, you go. What? At least he was on what? the show. <laughs> even if he's in there for like a 10 second segment. Dude. with with edge he realistically i think show. that they've been very smart with what they've been doing um i Just using bad him example. to bad but, example um, that's that's like saying the guy who walked behind when uh they were having the okay uh, damian uh, priest what was that damian priest killer or er, carrying cross Anybody that's else that he was bit, that he was in a fucking segment with this week? They made a point they, of putting him in segments with very, very wide, a very wide array of people on the roster. When so they were the, in the those Nakamura one was one that I brought up only because was he would not have been on the show segments, otherwise. And I'm going to finish this point. Words. So we're going to be they talking over each other, which is really cool. But something. anyway, I think it wasn't that, that they're doing this in a very smart way. English, to hold a conversation that they'd have him on the show. Did he really just talk over you? I'm trying to stir the pot. I'm going to be real. <laughs> he I, tried. What, he sir. tried. I still made my point. So he just comes off looking like a bitter old curmudgeon. So I win. You made your point that Shinsuke was on camera. Like yes. a background fucking... How else actor. would he have... He, he wouldn't he have been on the fucking show otherwise. He could have taken Edge out in the handcuffs. Those guys got more rub than fucking Shinsuke did in a fucking episode. Come on. So are you saying that, that Edge should have rubbed Shinsuke a lot more? If you're going to give a rub, at least have fucking Shinsuke say something on camera, hear the conversation. We got to hear it from Edge with all the other guys you mentioned. Because Shinsuke, Shinsuke doesn't speak the the dialect but that how Vince are loves. You getting him a rub if he can't speak Okay, English? anyway, whatever. Fuck off. No. Anyway, <laughs> dude, like he, he it's been very smart the way that they've used him. So He's had interactions with people on all three different rosters and he's not there to bury other people on the roster. I think that's the biggest issue that people, that people had when edge won the Royal rumble is that, okay, he's going to be the unequivocal number one challenger for absolutely everything. And he's going to make everybody look like shit as a result. So that didn't happen. And in fact, it's been the exact opposite. So let me go over to you, Simon Street. When it comes, I mean, look, you, I'm pretty sure you would say I didn't expect uh, Edge to win, and I, I don't know what your feelings are. Maybe you'll let us know. But, I mean, do you believe that he was the right winner for the Men's Royal Rumble? First of all, I didn't know he was going to win. Okay. Reason why is because they didn't have to do a surprise entry with him and that little promo he cut the week before, Royal Rumble. Lead to me to led me to believe for me my prediction that he probably was going to win the whole thing. Very strong possibility. Mm-hmm. I liked how he won the Royal Rumble. Let's put it that way. That he started. What number did he start? Sin City Steve. What 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 number? Well, it depends on it depends if you watch WWE backstage. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. We, because <laughs> if if you watch WWE backstage, then he entered at number two. But if you watch the pay per view itself, then he entered at number one. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. I just want to confirm. So yeah. at number one, did the fucking work, all right? Uh, didn't just disappear and then pop back in, literally was in there, uh, did good work. And it, I'm going to agree with Sin City Steve. I like how they're utilizing him. And he even said in this article too, um, mm-hmm. I think they paraphrased him, uh, you know, Ed was talking about, man, he once takes the opportunity to, to work with other guys he hadn't worked with before. I think that's an honest answer. Really honest answer, because if you think about it, even him showing up on NXT was exciting. Yes, 
most of the time I'm kind of like this when you know WWE is talking about first time ever somebody went into the men's restroom during the segment break you know WWE drums it up but this time it did mean something because you know Edge never went to NXT uh, as far as officially on TV do you see what I'm saying so it was special I like the commentary that he had between with Finn Balor and and uh and Pete Dunne I like that I like how he's toying around with everybody to make you wait I like that that's good utilization. I also think he said in this article as well, because I did read it, that right. he said that he's going to show up every day at work. He's going to show up. He wants to get in matches. If he's going to do it, he's going to do it. For me, this is how I would prefer to actually see a utilization of a person that is in the Royal Rumble. Because when you win the Royal Rumble, I got to believe based on the stats, and I'm sure, Cynthia Steve, this is where you could tell me the stats probably, but your percentage is pretty damn high of winning at WrestleMania. So if you're going to put in the work and you're enjoyable, hell yeah. Well, I mean, typically you'll have the same winning percentage as anybody else of oh, winning yeah. a match. Yeah. Well, well, <laughs> well, don't they give like stats? You thank you for correcting. Me. But don't they don't don't they give like stats WWE based on like yeah, yeah. This people who won the Royal Rumble went on to win the actual title match. So, you know, that's why I was hoping by the know. numbers, yeah. By the numbers, thank you. By the numbers. So I'm actually excited for it. I'm glad to see Edge back in the fray full time. Whatever the hell happens, whatever the hell happens. I'm happy. Let me, let me jump over to Matt Michaels. Now, let's be real. You know, I, I, even in yesterday's wrestling talk, um, you never fail that when we mention wrestlers, like I think I mentioned Cesaro, you mentioned Edge. It doesn't matter who we throw out there. Who's If they've been there for a while, you always go... Yes, but he, what is his fucking age? You always throw that out there. So the question I'm going to ask you, we know Edge is 47. Do you think that he was the right person to win this Royal Rumble? And I would just say based on age. And I say that just because you always throw age out there. Let's well, go. Let's put it this way. In this case, no, because we're all getting closer to his age. So... <laughs> Let's, let's not consider that old. I'm not in my shit. So what I find fascinating about this in terms of age, um, age in itself, I don't think the fans have a problem with. All right. I think they have the problem in terms of relativity to uh, pushing younger talent, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. Not, not established talent the same way. Sure. Now, I feel that the same people who probably had went ape shit about him winning are the same ones who watch AEW and had no problem with Chris Jericho winning the championship there. Mm. Okay. And Chris is Chris is a number of years older than than Edge. So I think that in those, you know, in those regards, um, it's a lot of noise from people who would have shit if uh, you know anyone else Ran, run won the rumble mm -hmm. you know the 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 other thing too is that remember going into this rumble the darling was daniel bryan right and so fans will also be pissed off because the person they thought should win didn't win now the, the next portion you got is business and the fact of the matter is, is that if you're going to headline WrestleMania with your guys this year, Edge versus Reigns would be probably your best way to go. Mm. However, I think that a lot of fans are going to be pissed if they go that way and they don't see Edge versus Finn Balor. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of those people who, you know, get this smarty mark thing and want to see, you know, him put over younger guys, you know, don't want to see him wrestle Reigns. They want to see him wrestle Finn or probably a small percentage want to see him wrestle McIntyre. Okay. Well, let me just quickly, if you can hold that thought, let me ask you guys who just quickly, who would you guys want to see him fight out of the three? I, I'm, yeah, I'm going to regretfully say Reigns. You said Reigns. What did you say, um, uh, Sid City? Reigns. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. All yeah. right. Go ahead, back. I'm sorry. Um. So then, you know, if you think about it, um, that's your ratings right there. That's the reason that that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Now, something we just talked about, mm -hmm. and this is where if you go, hey, 
Uncle Bruce, looking <laughs> for a little idea. Here we go. All right. You have never seen Edge and the Fiend, right? Edge was wrestling against Orton. So you have WrestleMania happen where, you know, he loses to Reigns. You don't put the belt on him. Or if you go ahead and put the belt on, on Edge, that's when Miz cashes in on Edge. Okay. You work Edge back to Raw. And you have Edge through his confrontations with Orton. Guess who comes to Orton's aid? The Fiend. And now you transition from Edge and Orton into Edge and the Fiend. And that's how you bring it back around. You just, you have now a post WrestleMania into SummerSlam, and there's your main event for SummerSlam. Or well, the good thing too, uh, I, I like what you're selling because one thing I've noticed too with Edge's tendencies in, in every one of his uh, world tour of the different brands, um, he gives off this impression like you know, I, you know, I'm still the the the, uh, the ever opportunist. You know, he he's been saying that quite a few often, so it leads me to believe that there's still you know, at some point that's still in him. So when you say the fiend, right? I'm wondering if you got in a confrontation with the fiend, you know, what we talked about last time was people are affected. Would you go back to being the opportunist old school edge per se for people who remember uh, heel edge, which is exciting, you know? Well, and, and again, we don't know how the fiend's coming back. So if that's a possibility, then that's the great way to bring the evil into edge. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing truly after you use him for WrestleMania and you have him going through the steps, if Christian is cleared as it's reported that he is, I wouldn't be surprised if we see them together just one more time in a quick, you know, tag team program to have the belts and then put over some of the younger guys on, you know, as a tag team. Hmm. I also could see edge turning on Christian too. What about, uh, <laughs> what about if we saw Edge and Christian versus Randy Orton and Karrion Cross? Thus, Cross and Orton, dissension happens there, and then you get that feud, which they hinted at via Twitter. Yeah. I, th I think that it's interesting, just in theory, between just Cross and Orton in general, because what you see there really is you. I just you just see Vince <laughs> getting the videotape and going, "When did Randy, Randy wrestle in Impact?" <laughs> <laughs> no, Vince, that's a totally different guy. Well, sign him up, pal. We got another Randy Orton for twenty years. <laughs> I can um, imagine it actually sounding like that, actually, for real. And everybody just look at him like, all right, all right, let's just roll with it. Because if you try to challenge the boss, it's not, it's, you're going to be, you're going to be fired. Yeah. Randy Orton and Sable. I like those two together. <laughs> or do you want us to get the hands to put on her breast again? Do we want us, do, do we want to go that direction? Oh, hey, man. Cross, he said it, not us. Oh, right. shit. <laughs> man would say some shit like that like do you think scarlet would want to wear what sable wore with the hands i'm, I'm Vince man you never know what he's gonna say all right well we'll jump over into oh, our, our okay, third really quick. did you just say vince would say <laughs> we're gonna have him we're gonna have him Not, wear what sable wore with the hands <laughs> in the chest i'm saying scarlet can scarlet wear what sable wore with the oh, hands yes. I'm saying that sounds like something that Vince McMahon would probably say. All right. Disagree with me. I'll wait. Okay. There we go. All right. We're going to move now over to our third count, which comes from figure four on um, four online. And this one is titled AEW New Japan Pro Wrestling Established Working 
relationship. And it just starts off saying that on Wednesday edition of the Wrestling Observer, Dave Meltzer said that the quote, the deal is done, end quote, on a working relationship with AEW and New Japan Pro Wrestling. Of course, we saw Kenta's appearance at Wednesday's beach break and then next week's lights out match uh, with uh, him, AEW World Champion Kenny Omega, John Moxley, and Lance Archer are kicking things off. But Melcher says he's unaware of anything else that is planned after that. He also says, I know people that can't wait to go back to Japan, put it that way. Um, he uh, also talks about that, um, I, I guess this was something that was supposed to maybe happen uh, earlier, but I guess at the time, uh, New Japan had a, a different uh, president uh, at the time. And um, uh, I guess something didn't work out well with him. And so now with the new leadership in there, they was able to come together and finally put something together. Yeah. So I guess this is, uh, you know, we had had discussions on, we don't know, you know, who's working with who, what, but how good, how great is this team pairing um, I guess I'm supposed to start with uh, with Matt Michaels. Uh, tell us, what's your thoughts on this, man? What, wh how excited or not excited or how good you think this is now with this new relationship with AEW in New Japan finally got this working relationship going? So I think that um, what I love about Dave is that Dave is the king of making a statement like the deal is done <laughs> then going outside of this one shot i don't know any plans for the future but the <laughs> deal is in place so i take it for what it is i think that you know if they can work together great um i love his blanket statement of there's a lot of guys who would like to go back to japan yeah, there's a whole country that would like to be able to go back to Japan, Dave, right about now. So very, very obvious statements from Captain Obvious Meltzer. Um, listen, it won't hurt them by any means. And um, if, you, if you look at the, um, the blurred lines between what they're doing with Impact and what they're doing with this, and it's possibly a great thing right? Maybe getting some exposure for other guys, but you're also giving exposure to other guys on other brands. Hopefully it boosts the other shows. Um, the weird thing about it is simply this. AEW has only been around for just over a year and they need to reach out to other federations to bump up their talent. That's strange, man. Wow. That's strange. That's it, it's really not worrisome in the fact that obviously the ratings aren't hurting by any means to where TNT needs to get involved and tell them you can't do this and you can only do this. Blah, blah, blah. <coughs> but um, what's, what's alarming about that is I think that if you were to look three years in, right. And had these guys, your guys established, mm -hmm to where it wasn't a wrestling fan of, you know, guys who watch all the different products, right? Because for them, it's a fantasy matchup, all right? But for an audience that you're trying to build and get hooked on your guys to make these guys seem so important, and then you have them interact with these other companies, that would probably make a little more impact on the actual fans who don't follow. Listen, honestly, who the fuck is Kenta in the eyes of people who only watch AEW? Mm. <laughs> right? I mean, I, I mean, that's honest. And if you're talking about, you know, uh, let's say a 10 year old kid's watching with his dad and, or his mom, and they don't follow anything other than, you know, the TV's on. I'm kind of interested because my kid likes this. Who's that? I don't know who that is, son. And now you have to entrust that they're going to be able to give that viewer a 
thorough history or something that makes them invested in that guy who's not even part of their company. So it, I'm, I'm taking it from the tough angle. It becomes a tough angle. Um, hopefully there's a working relationship, but hopefully it doesn't overshine the actual talent that AEW has to the point when the Good Brothers stop showing up and you became a fan of the Good Brothers and you can't get, you know, Axios TV. I mean, who won <laughs> at that point? So let me jump over to you, uh, Simon Street. Um, when you heard about this, you know, deal is done. <laughs> um, what was your what was your thoughts on that? And I mean, I guess ultimately, if there is this working relationship with um, Impact Wrestling, I don't I don't know what that means. I mean, could one assume that means that there could be some movement between? Um, New Japan working with Impact with AEW. I mean, you know, it, it's, you know, I mean, Matt Michael says that blurred line, but uh, I don't know. What's your thoughts when you heard about this? What do you see? Well, for me personally, <clears throat> um, I've talked about this for a long time. Uh, wanting to see them make good, I guess, I, I don't want to say promise because I don't think they ever promised it, but they definitely um, talked about uh, moving forward to what AEW was kind of going to kind of be and um, having open relationships with other uh, promotions and um, you know and, and again that's uncharted territory and, and that might be some of those blurred lines that Michael talks about because it, it you got to figure out what's the structure with that to where we know the reality not everybody's gonna win equally but if it's going to provide exposure for other talent whether they be on the AEW roster who aren't you know from, you know, WWE yesterday, let's put it that way, okay? Um, it also <clears throat> brings culture to people who probably only watch AEW or wrestling promotions as it is in, on, on American television who might actually be excited to see someone from New Japan that they would never thought. And then before you know it, they're like, wow, I should probably should check this out. Mm -hmm. um, I agree with what Matt Michaels is saying with regards to that scenario where he said with Access TV. Um, now, even though I joke around, it's kind of a really serious thing because I could see somebody watch AEW, really love the Good Brothers, and then when they finally are on AEW no more, they go to Access TV, and then someone's like, well, why can't I immediately quickly find it? And again, I'm not going to go deeply into that because I've been the worst critic of Access TV from the get-go. Um, but what I will say is that when I first heard about AEW, this is immediately what came to mind. Now, whether I just thought about it just out of thin air, but I see the potential because I know WWE will never do it. And I hope that they can come up with a good structure plan, some kind of way to where it can work. And I would like to see, like I said before on the past on the show, I'd like to see a big event that's once a year, it doesn't necessarily have to be titled on the line per se, but to where you see a mashup with all the different promotions. I think that would be something to see. I would actually be excited to watch something like that. And I do think it may provide an opportunity for some of those AEW stars that people say, like, they're not doing a good job of showcasing those AEW originals. Let's put it that way, right? I think this is a good opportunity to kind of see what they can do, you know, extend a platform, you know? Yes, COVID is limiting some things, but wouldn't it be cool to see someone from AEW that normally isn't on the show all the time show up in New Japan? Do you see what I'm saying? That could possibly help them because there's been people in WWE that left WWE, went to New Japan, and then got made. And then when they came back stateside, it was like, wow. So, I mean, there, there's something to that is what I'll say. So I'm excited. Yeah. Awesome. So, Sin City, Steve, I know I was um, watching AEW this past week, and they, they had mentioned they're going to start this uh, Women's World Championship Eliminator Tournament of some sort. But I noticed they had women that they're going to have from the States and also they're going to have the competition from women that are from Japan. Um, I, I'm just, and I'm just assuming I could be wrong. I'm thinking maybe these women are coming from new Japan or maybe or not. Okay. So maybe well, that's something. Well, so, okay. so here's the thing is sure. new Japan. They don't really, um, they, they don't have women's matches on the show. Gotcha. Um, okay. So, I didn't think uh, I saw any, but I, you know, I, I was well, trying to connect. Yeah, so New, J New yeah. Japan is owned by Bushi Road, 
and they quite literally own another all women's promotion um, called Stardom. So it's okay. so they are owned by the same company, but they are completely separate, okay. um, and they do not market together. Okay. So is this then? Um, I, I'm I, I must assume you got to be pretty hyped then oh, yeah. to hear about this partnership that they have. And, um, you know, what do you think going to come out of this? And how about addressing some of the concerns that uh, Matt Michaels uh, have brought up as well? Uh, you know, maybe overshadowing some of the the AEW um, wrestlers or, or, or even fans not even recognizing who certain people are like Kenta that mm -hmm. kind. I mean, for people that didn't know Kenta, that was a big thing that happened this past week. And some people probably look and go, oh, okay, who's that? You know, right. now if you're a big fan, of course you know, but yeah, some 10 year old probably. But anyway, just address that. And overall, what's your, um, how ecstatic are you about this relationship? Sure. So I think that what really was kind of holding this from taking place since day one was Harold May, who was the former president for New Japan Pro Wrestling. Mm -hmm. um, he and Kenny Omega had quite a falling out, to say the mm. very least. Okay. And that is, uh, Harold May is the, the reason why Kenny Omega left New Japan completely. Mm. Okay. So, um, and this was at a time when Omega had the IWGP Heavyweight Championship. Okay. So he was, uh, he was at the top of the show. He was, you know, he, he had earned the nickname, you know, the best bout machine because he would go, you know, no, almost no matter who he faced, he would be able to, you know, get an amazing match out of that individual. And when he was across the ring from someone like Okada, you have instant classics. Um, so I think that with Harold May gone, that really kind of opened the door um, to the working relationship um, so much so that you have people like Kenta that, you know, have come over now, mm -hmm. obviously uh, Excalibur, I believe it was at the very end, they were just attempting to um, you know, they were, they were just attempting to at a breakneck pace, put over Kenta and who he was and all that kind of stuff. Um, to be honest, I, I would have been just as okay with, um, you know, Excalibur saying, oh my God, it's Kenta, what's he doing here? And then you cut, you don't, you don't divulge any info about Kenta. And you, you honestly think that Excalibur knows who Kenta is? <laughs> yes. I would hope he knows. Just, just because, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that, I think it's, it's one of those things that, you know, we're going to see them start to put out the vignettes with, you know, Moxley involved and why Kenta is chasing him and, you know, why he followed him to AEW and all this kind of stuff. I really think that we're going to get the backstory on that um, as far as, you know, whatever kind of a kayfabe backstory that they're going to build. Um, but I think that, you know, we really don't have a whole lot to worry about in that instance um I, I i have more faith in aew and new japan um kind of retconning things as need be um if they have to um to to make everything kind of mesh and to make sense at the end of the day though um i think that this partnership this partnership is huge for everyone involved um i think that it's it's kind of funny you know, you see AEW working with Impact, you see them working with New Japan, mm -hmm. and then you just got to figure ROH is, you know, that uh, that jilted lover that uh, that they won't call back. Um, so, I mean, they're not going to they're not going to work with ROH, but they're going to work with seemingly every other promotion. Um, oh, yeah. NWA, too. Um, so to answer Matt Michaels's point, I think that, you know, this is something that I've talked about on the show and I'm pretty sure that we've all talked about on the show is that it is important for, you know, the, the, the second tier feds to kind of work together. And I think that that's going to, that's going to better everybody in the, in the long haul. Um, I think that I don't see any negativity. Uh, let's put it this way. Um, as far as this, this working relationship, would I love to possibly see Kenny Omega versus Kota Ibushi? Um, you know, the, the, the one time 
uh, that the golden lovers are actually going to get in there and wrestle each other. Hell yeah. I'd love to see that. That'd be awesome. Do it at the Tokyo dome. Or if, if it wants to be done stateside, then do it at Madison square garden, whatever. And I think that any way that that happens, it's going to be a very good thing. Mm -hmm. Um, as far as furthering AEW's women's division, um, I think that it's abundantly clear that at this point they have to outsource their women's division in order for there to be any sort of relevancy, mm -hmm. uh, which is something that we talk about every single week on the show, but it bears repeating every single week. Um, and it, it sucks that they have to outsource, um, you know, their, their women's division um, in order to get relevancy, but that's where they are at this point. And I think that this is a smart way of doing this by having a U.S. and Japan um, tournament. And essentially the way that it's all going to work is the, um, the Japanese women are going to compete in their own little tournament. And then the U.S. women are going to compete in their own little tournament. And then the winner of the Japanese tournament is going to come over here stateside. Um, I don't know if they're going to record the, the matches at stardom and then, you know, use those to fill up time slots during AEW uh, dynamite. I don't, I hope not genuinely, but um, we'll see how that goes. Um, I think that they're grasping for straws at this point. They're trying to do anything that they can yeah. um, to further their women's division. And yeah. let's be real the they're throwing anything on the wall that they can and just seeing what sticks, praying that something does stick at this point. Sure. Awesome stuff, guys. That is our, uh, our three count for this show. We're going to uh, give some uh, final thoughts here and then a few reminders as we uh, come to the conclusion of our show. Let me start over with you, uh, Simon Street. What would you like the people out there to know for the week? Uh, just pretty much, you know, uh, stay, uh, you know, stay safe out there, obviously. Um, thank you so much for supporting the show. Uh, it really does mean a lot to us. Uh, we enjoy doing this for y'all, uh, truth be told. Um, and the more feedback y'all give, the more insight it gives us. Um, we are definitely a pro uh, uh, evolution type of brand. And so we're always looking for opportunities to entertain you. So uh, if you have any comments, suggestions, please don't be afraid. We never, never going to, uh, uh, you know, push you away or ignore you. So with, with that, have a good evening and uh, talk to y'all soon. Yeah. And definitely when he talks about, you know, reaching out, you can always email us. It's, it's a very long title, but it is Vegas Bad Boys with a Z of podcasting at gmail.com but you can always just hit us up on our social media if you follow us uh just dm us uh you know twitter ig whatever and we usually respond um if you know when we see fit so uh, yes definitely sin city what you want to tell the people thank you guys for hanging out with us tonight uh thank you for um liking sharing subscribing and and sharing um, our, our podcast and our brand with your friends and with, with everybody that matters to you. We, we truly appreciate you. And as Simon Street said, we do this for you. So thank you. Um, special shout out and special thank you to all of the brave, brave men and women serving this country um, on lands, both foreign and domestic. Um, you enable us to be able to do what we're doing right now. So thank you very much. And uh, also repsports.com, R-E-P-P sports.com. Go there, um, get all of your, uh, you know, get all of your pre-workout, your weight loss, your energy drink needs, um, reppsports.com, promo code Vegas at checkout, be like Carlito and okay. save 15%. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Matt Michaels, man, what do you want to tell the folks? I really don't want to tell them anything as much as I'd like to, uh, clue them in on something they might have missed um so if you listen closely when the mask came off of kenta you could hear jim ross go oh my god it's funaki funaki slobber knocker 
Barbecue sauce. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Matt Michaels. We we definitely appreciate that. You know, it, 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 he's got that ear, guys. He do because I didn't hear it. So, but I trust his ear. Uh, we want to <laughs> remind everyone to if you don't have our app to download it, it's free. iOS uh, or Android, just type Vegas Bad Boys again with the Z. It'll pop up. Uh, download it. Um, we we like to communicate through everyone on there, especially when the shows are on and pay-per-view so do that um hey if you got the cash app send us a buck or two send us a hundred if you like our tagline is uh vegas bad boys again all we have to say with the z someone might put the s and we don't want it to go to whoever that is um and so uh and of course that funds you send will uh we will help uh build our uh platform by letting other people know that uh we exist so they can enjoy the show just as much as you do all right, so with that, we thank everybody for um, uh, listening to us. And until then, we'll see you next time. Peace Barbecue out. Song.